Good morning. Oh, let's see who is teaching today. You are Armando, of course. How you doing, Armando? Hello. <laughs> Armando, or anybody, can anybody hear me? Yeah, I can. Yes. Good morning, I hear you. Okay, I, I thought I was talking to myself there for a little bit. Armando, can you not hear me? Yeah. I think he's muted. Well, yeah, he's more, he's, he's muted, but the question is, can he hear me? <laughs> Wait a minute, that's not what I want. That's the wrong thing. Okay, over here. Let's see. Well, Amy's here. Don't Armando. I see him, but okay. I don't know. Anyway, how's everybody doing today? Fine. Bye. Thank you. How are you? Good. Good. It's Wednesday. We're halfway through the week. Um, <clears throat> so today. We're going to take a deep dive into this stuff called acrylic paint. Okay, uh, some of you. How many people out there use acrylic? I do. Okay. Yeah. So two or three of you. Um, once in a while, rarely. Once in a while, rarely. Okay. Um, you know, back way back when uh, dinosaurs roamed the earth, and I was first beginning to paint. Um, I wanted to basically study oils when I was real young. Um, and then I started studying with Tony Manny, who was an oil painter. And uh, so he, he basically kept me drawing for really the first year and a half uh, and then gave me some pastels. But after that, my, my next introduction to paint was not a oil paint. It was acrylics. And... Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Milton Lenore who was teaching at the school uh, with Tony and I took some classes with him. And he had a very, a very different sort of technique. Um, it was a very stylized sort of landscape painting and he, he generally painted a, a lot of boats and boat houses and, you know, sort of things like, New England type uh, scenes, you know, that were kind of very modern and, uh, you know, very kind of almost monochromatic. But uh, I painted with him for almost a year and, uh, you know, good, good painter um, and learned, you know, a lot of things uh, about using acrylic paint with him. And it's, it's a very different process than oil. Uh, and at the time, my thing with acrylic paint is, or was, that at that point in time, acrylic paints were kind of like in an early stage of development, and you would mix a color, and then half an hour later, the color would totally be gone. It would be gray, you know, it would just kind of fade back into this very kind of muted sort of mixture. And, uh, and so for a long time, I really didn't like acrylics, you know, because of that. Um, and so I, I moved on into oils and things like that, much, much happier with the fact that you don't get the color shift. Well, over the years, uh, by the time that I had gone to the Academy of Art, uh, and that was what, in, and it was probably like 12, 12 years uh, time since I had ori originally used acrylics. They had done a lot of work on them. And, um, you know, acrylics have improved greatly as far as uh, the color not shifting as much. And they have different mediums and things in them now so that they're not as flat 
and you get a lot of variety uh, now with acrylics. And you can, uh, there's a lot of different manufacturers out there who uh, sell acrylic paint, but uh, really some of the very best brands are the store brands, such as uh, Binders. You know, they have great acrylic paint um, that they manufacture themselves. Uh, Utrecht is another uh, acrylic paint that I highly recommend. Um, you know, really good product. Uh, it's easy to use, easy to clean up, um, but it, it has a lot of the qualities that people look for in oil paint. Uh, their paint comes a little bit thicker, a little bit heavier body, so it doesn't it doesn't flatten out on the canvas the way that say uh, a paint like Liquitex would. Uh, Liquitex, uh, they were one of the early people in the uh, in the game of making acrylic paint uh, commercially available to artists, but uh, and they've got great color variety and uh, a, a wide range of products, but uh, the paint itself is very thin and will always flatten out unless you buy one of their additives uh, to change the consistency or the drying time of the paint. And believe me, they have a ton of them. So uh, uh, right now, probably uh, the best quality acrylic paint as far as saturation to pigment that you can buy is a paint called Golden. And they make great acrylic paint. It's a great product. It's considerably more expensive than a lot of the store brands. But, uh, you know, you can get as good, if not, you know, well, I'd say comparable paint out of binders or Utrecht. And uh, again, it's probably half the cost. So there's a significant difference there. Um, but you know, whatever paint you use, you know, you, the thing about acrylic paint is that you can do so much with it. It's not a, uh, it's, it's not like a one trick pony, you know, that will only do one thing. You can use it in so many different ways. Uh, today, it's probably one of the most versatile medias out there. So you can use it in a traditional way uh, where it's direct painting. You can use it for decorative work, um, you know, on a wide variety of materials, including ceramics. Uh, you can also use it, um, you know, as like thin sort of glaze layers. And they make acrylic paint that will basically stick on anything. Uh, anything from fabrics to glass, uh, like I said, ceramic ware, metals. Um, so, you know, if, uh, you know, if there's a surface that you need to paint, there's an acrylic paint out there that will do it, okay? You can't say that for oils or really almost any other paint medium. So, uh, you know, acrylic is, you know, you gotta, you gotta hand it, you know, to the manufacturers. They definitely have made a variety of paint out there that you can do almost anything with, okay? So um, I'm gonna play a couple of videos and uh, I'm also gonna show you some artists who work at acrylic and uh, you'll be kind of surprised, I think, because you really can't, in many cases, differentiate acrylic from oil. And that's always been sort of the big, uh, one of the big battles, you know, in, in fine art is how do I work with this non-toxic paint and get the same kind of effects uh, that I wanted to get with oil paint, okay? So I'm gonna start off with a young man who's gonna do a portrait demo. And uh, then we'll kind of move on through and look at different things that you can do with this. Armando, can you hear me yet?
You got to unmute yourself. I don't know. <laughs> 24 colors. And I've even got some. So I got 12 premium professional brushes here. Acrylic brushes, which I'm dying to try out. That's going to be really awesome. And I got a sponge. Got, got me a sponge. And pretty nifty palette knife. This is a set of products that you can buy. A big package that you can buy from Salvador and get you ready to go ahead and get started with your acrylic painting journey. Now this video is about a review on the Salvador Premium Acrylic Paints and I thought what better way to do a review on a product in particular a type of paint than to create a portrait painting tutorial on it. So let's go ahead and get into a portrait painting tutorial using acrylic paints. Now Salvador graciously also sent me uh, a palette to use to mix the acrylic paints. Uh, but since I already have some experience working with acrylic paints, and what we're gonna be doing is testing the paints themselves, I decided what I'm gonna do is use my Stay Wet palette. This is a, a palette that has a sponge, a wet sponge underneath. You can create this uh, type of setup easily with a sponge and then a piece of transparent paper over top. And what that's gonna do is it's going to help me keep the paints fresh for a longer period of time. But I will be using the brushes that they sent me when it comes time to the, um, the smaller shapes. Last but not least with acrylics, you're gonna need uh, some rags to clean up the brushes or paper towels and a little container of water and of course your canvas or your panel whatever surface you'd like to work on make sure that it is acrylic acrylic primed and not oil primed so I just have um, Frederick's cotton canvas stretched onto 1620 stretcher bars this has been uh, triple quadruple uh, gessoed with acrylic gesso beforehand. So you wanna have a nice absorbent acrylic surface to work on. And again, I'm gonna have links to all this information in the description box down below. So we're gonna start out this painting in the Caroscuro method. So we've got burnt umber there, and now I'm gonna put ivory black over here. A generous amount of paint. I'm going to cover the entirety of the white of the canvas first. Americans over 64 can get a stimulus check, but you have to claim it now. The Social Security Administration is... All righty, so the first thing we're going to do, as I mentioned before, is just cover the entirety of the canvas with that dark color. I'm going to use a little bit of the water to help apply the paint. And already I can, I can feel a nice richness to the paint. I'll be able to compare this paint, um, at least the feel of the paint, to um, the other acrylics that I have used, which are uh, Liquitex and Golden. Alrighty, so we got the canvas covered. Now one thing I want to point out while it is a drawing is the lid. So there's nothing wrong with the, the lid, but it's it's a little different. So it's um, it's sealed on the top. And I, I assume that has something to do with, there you go, now it's zoomed in. I assume that has something to do uh, with the preservation of the paint, but this is no problem. All you need to do is get a, a knife or something that's not that sharp and then uh, just spin and there it is it's a where's the, where's the camera angle and there it is Alrighty, so that was step one of the process and the acrylic has settled very nicely i have no complaints at this point with the acrylic paints. Now the next part of this process is going to be the basic block-in. The basic linear block-in um, 
since we're working on a dark surface, you could use something like white chalk. Uh, you can even use charcoal, though it would be difficult to see your lines. I'm going to use just a pastel. And for the basic block in, you just want to have a few simple straight lines and angles indicating the size of the head, the placement of the head, and no details, no details at all. No details needed, no eyelashes. I wouldn't start off with the little nostrils and things like that. You don't want that at this stage, though you can do it. I'm never gonna say never, um, but you know, oftentimes it's much easier to start uh, with just simple shapes, straight lines and angles to indicate where everything is going to fit. So let me go ahead and finish the block in now. Alrighty, so now we have the basic block in, and like I said, there are no details, no details at all, just a line for the nose, a line for the mouth, a line for the axes of the eyes, and the axes of the rest of the features, the axes of the eyes, eyebrow, nose, mouth, remember the thirds, so the uh, hairline to the eyebrow, a third, eyebrow at the bottom of the nose, a third, bottom to the nose, chin, another third. So using the titanium white, I'm gonna go ahead and go straight in with titanium white. And one of the things that is most uh, advantageous about acrylic is its fast drying nature. And we're working with the technique of chiroscuro, which means we're basically drawing with the light. Now there are many ways to do chiroscuro. Um, this is just my preferred way, and I find it easier to see um, mistakes in your drawing. Well, we don't have much of a drawing yet, but it's easier to compose with value. And this is not something that's just done with oil paint, but you can also do this with acrylic paint using the fast drying nature of the acrylics. Now, one thing I'll notice, since I'll be, I'll be comparing this to um, Liquitex and Golden, one thing I'm noticing right away is that this is a little more transparent than the Liquitex acrylic. Not a negative, um, it just, it's a little thinner and that's okay. We can work with that. Now, you want to set up the basic shape in such a way that you are using straight lines and angles. Remember, this is just like drawing with lines, but instead we're drawing with mass. So let me go ahead and continue to fill in all of the light masses. What I'm gonna do now is go in with the, the, um, the oxide black. And I'm gonna start to draw the hair mass and then build on it. Now while we're still in the basic uh, light, light and dark mass, I think now is the time to introduce something for the background. So I'm going to go ahead and use black and white, but just a little bit of the white. And uh, as I was mentioning before, the paint is a little bit thinner, which is not a bad thing, it's just something we get used to. And uh, with acrylic, it's nice that it's a fast drying, it has a fast drying nature. So I can literally push my problems aside. See that? Just pushing the corner of the ear. And as I paint the background, I also make the silhouette, the outside shape, a little bit more accurate. And I'm going to let the background be almost completely black, but with a little bit of the titanium, or not, the, yeah, the titanium light, sorry. I'm so used to saying ivory black, but this is a oxide, oxide black. But it, I mean, it's, it's the same, it feels the same. Now, this is the power of the light and dark stage. So the basic light mass is what determines what you know, what you focus on, what you, what you look at when you're observing a picture. Now with 
with acrylic, I, I like to start a little bit more narrow when I'm painting, just so I give myself room to expand. Hmm. And don't have this idea with acrylic that um, you know, every mark must be perfect because background color, you just go right into the background color and move things. I don't want his arms to be cut off, so I want some kind of information for the arms. Alrighty, so now that we have the basic light mass indicated, now at this stage I must say the drawing doesn't have to be that perfect. We're going to continue to build and build and build and build with each one of these stages. And again, with the uh, Salvador, the only thing I'm noticing is that the paint is a little bit thinner, uh, but that's all right. Uh, I was able to build up the layers. I may have his hand a little bit too um, too large, and I'm not sure. So I usually just do something like this. So down to here, the chest should be about one head length down. Obviously, we're looking over a little bit, um, but so that's about good. And then this distance here should equal this distance. So we're about good with that. Now let's move into some color. This revolutionary tooth cleaner is saving users from expensive and painful surgery. It's tartar, plaque, and even stains. Uh, and what we've got here is very simple. The Zorn palette. I know you saw Zorn palette last week and you'll continue to see Zorn palette color combinations because I'm a favorite. So we have vermilion here, the yellow ochre, the titanium white that you saw before. How about we use these brushes? So I'm going to start off with, uh, let's start off with this uh, number 10 brush. So I'm going to have a number 10 and a number, uh, let's say a number, number eight. So I'm going to guide you through a simple flesh tone mixture using acrylic paint and the Zorn palette. So you want to start off with an orangey color. We're going to mix right into here. So we're going to use vermilion and yellow ochre. Vermilion yellow ochre gives you some kind of kind of neutral orangey color. And now you just tint it. So a little bit of the titanium white. Darken it to bring down the chroma. With ivory black, go back into the vermilion. And of course, I go into much more detail about this because I won't be explaining the color mixtures too much in my online classes. I start off. I started off my students uh, last week using flesh color. If you want to check out my online classes, go to Patreon.com/slash/UpariArtist and look for the mentorship tier. Ten dollars a month, you get uh, the option to send me images for teacher-student feedback, and I actually create videos for my students featuring the feedback. So it's like an online class. It's a, it's, sorry, it's like an in-person class, virtual classroom. So now that we have a nice and basic flush tone, we're going to now use this to draw with. And I do mean draw. So with the chiaroscuro approach, so that's a little bit too light. So we're getting the same color mixture. I'm just going to make it a little bit darker with the vermilion and the ivory black. Um, so I'm going to start off with the half tones. Now I'm going to have a chance to talk about the color mixtures with the, um, the Salvador paints as I'm doing this. And it's got a really nice consistency to it. The thin the thinness of the paint is actually now starting to come in handy. Now with acrylic, um, the biggest question that I get whenever I do acrylic is how to blend. And um, the answer is uh, you don't want to blend um, in the beginning. And when you get into the later finishing stages, it's a matter of matching your values, knowing how to work with your values. And uh, with acrylic, you really have to be on your game when it comes to um, identifying value families. And you want to paint thick uh, so that 
and you have an idea, a pretty good idea of what your value range is. If you paint too thin, it's actually a little transparent. Uh, if you paint too thin, then you kind of don't have too much of a gauge of what your values are. And in the past tutorial that I made uh, featuring acrylic paints, I was saying to layer, uh, layer lighter because it actually dries a little darker. Uh, but what I found is that if you paint thick, thicker with your acrylic, it dries pretty close, uh, almost identical to what it looked like when it was wet. So just paint thick. You want to be deliberate. Alrighty, so now what I'm going to do is with the same basic color uh, setup, I'm now going to start to build those basic half tones. So it's a little bit uh, more, more red over here. And the shape itself can actually come out a little further. So about there. And you want to you want to focus on the clarity of your shapes and the specificity of these basic shapes. So the vermilion uh, doesn't have as much tinting strength, but we'll uh, make a note of that. Now let's see if we can, there we go. Just needed more vermilion. And mind you, I'm keeping these color combinations simple. That's why I'm using the Zorn palette. Now I'm gonna walk my way up here. As you're seeing, I'm starting to build these planes. Just like a sculpture. Remember, if you're new to this, a plane just means a three-dimensional concept of a flat sheet in space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to fill in all of these planes now. And then check back in with you. If you're on Medicare Part A and B and born before 1956, pay close attention to this video. U.S. residents born before... And I'm back. So this is just to show you that the principles are universal. Uh, you know, even though this is not oil paint, clearly, it's not oil paint because it would still be wet. Um, you know, even though this is not oil paint, I'm handling it in the same kind of sense in terms of basic shape and structure. So now we're going to move into the next stage of this process. So the next stage is going to be the refinement stage. So now we're going to refine the planes. Remember a plane is just a two-dimensional uh, construct of a flat sheet in space. You can imagine the picture plane here. Well, <laughs> you can imagine the picture surface here as a plane, coincidentally the word, the term is picture plane. Uh, so I'm going to use black and white and a little bit of flesh tone. I know you can't really see the palette. Uh, well, I'm just explaining the mixtures to you. Again, if you want to learn more about color and portrait painting and just painting in particular and drawing, check out my online classes, patreon.com slash Upari Artist. So with the, with the uh, subdivision of planes with acrylic, I, I do want to point out that you're kind of living in the moment with acrylic. So you put a mark down and you leave it. You make a decision and if you don't like it, you change it in about a couple seconds really. Uh, the acrylic is very workable and uh, I like the Salvador so far. It, it does settle a little faster, I'm noticing, than um, like a Liquitex or a Golden Wood which is actually helping me out a lot. So with the refinement stage, 
you really want to continue to hone in on your drawing. That's the big thing. Now typically, I don't really like to lean my hand on the, uh, on the painting, but uh, with acrylic, like I said, living in the moment, you want to be very deliberate with your marks in the refinement stage. In the big plane stage that we were in just earlier, um, you know, it could be more loose, you could move things around. Um, but now, now you really want to start to start to build that sense of structure. And uh, this is going to be a, a one day painting, but you can continue to work on this multiple days. And the nice thing about acrylic, uh, I have acrylic still life that I'm working on currently, um, that I started before this, uh, but you can just continue working without having to think about, well, is my surface going to be ready for me to work on the next day or a couple days? So it's, it's really a good medium to just jump in without that fear of, you know, when is it going to dry? It's just something you have to get used to if you're an oil painter. Um, that whole like putting a mark down and just, you know, having it dry in a couple seconds. I'm not going to say it's any better or any worse than oil painting. It's just different. But now, um, you know, getting back to the uh, review of the uh, Salvador acrylic paints. I'm really enjoying the drying time. I find that this dries a little faster than the, uh, the Liquitex and the Golden. And I, I also enjoy the transparent nature of the titanium white. Titanium white is usually, uh, you think of it as an, as an opaque, um, but it, it's pretty transparent with this. Uh, and it is so fast drying, uh, it's actually settling even on my Stay Wet palette, which you could say is a negative, but um, it's not really too much of a problem. I haven't lost any of the paint. Uh, it's all usable. It just it gets a little tacky towards the burnt umber on the palette, and that's okay. So I'm going to show you how I put in some more refinement for this eye, and then I'll do another cut, and then we'll return and see how this painting turns out. <coughs> you keep on staying in this one spot. You don't want to stay in one area for too long. This is the same with uh, oil painting and with acrylic painting. Uh, it's easy to get tunnel vision and then mm -hmm. just forget about the big picture. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of correcting things as I go, as I start to add more information. You know, the eyebrow needed to move down a little bit. So I'm gonna do that. And again, the forgiving nature, I'm gonna switch back to the bigger brush. The forgiving nature of acrylic is that it dries right away and lets you work right on top of it. If you're going to be indecisive about things, then it can be a, a negative. But, you know, just be direct. Direct with your brush marks. And know that you can change things easily. Speaking of change things, you probably noticed, or maybe you didn't notice, 
that I put in some of the uh, gray for the background, uh, just so that I can see the shape of our model's hair. That is going to be quite an important thing to uh, to see to get the likeness. A lot of likeness is just in the, the shape of the head. Alrighty, so that should be about enough to show you how I'm starting to put more refinement in one area. Now I'm just going to carry this kind of thinking throughout the rest of the uh, shapes, constantly adjusting the drawing as I start to add in more and more information. The closer the values get to one another, the more subtlety and the more subtlety uh, the more illusion of form that we'll get. Quiet. It's time for church. There are no churches. And there you have much more uh, refinement now. We moved from here to here. And I was actually working all around, so I'm um, just adding more and more planes, more and more information. Now I know what you must be wondering. Um, yes, this is acrylic. It does kind of start to look like oil paint after you put in all of the values, but um, I know you must be wondering about the um, how one blends, so to speak. I don't really like the word blending. Uh, rather, I think of it as putting in planes. So that's more of a sharp transition so that probably wasn't a good example i think uh, let's move down to here there we go this one would be a, a much better explanation for the uh, quote unquote blending but for me it's more about getting values so close to one another that they're you know the separation between the values is almost unnoticeable to the eye unless you're really looking for it so I, I play this game, subtlety. Subtlety means how close can you get values to one another, yet maintain their um, differentiation from one another. So that right there, to jump from here, here and here. So there's one, two, three, jump in value, all in this time span of what, like less than a minute maybe? And the acrylic paint stays open for that period of time that you need to jump in value from one place to another. And as long as you're painting thick, uh, relatively thick, of course this is a tiny brush, but as long as you're painting thick, it will dry pretty, pretty close, if not exactly the same as the value that you're observing as you're painting. And I found that for me, it dries the same. So um, going back to the, uh, the review of these paints, they're pretty good. I would definitely say these are artist quality acrylic paints. I have no complaints with the way that they dry, the way that they handle. And as you can tell, um, you know, it's a fairly limited palette. You don't need that much uh, color on the, uh, the face. Sometimes if you put too many jumps in saturation or chroma, uh, it tends to make the flesh tones a little less harmonious. So you want a type of uniform uh, chroma throughout. Obviously, there's going to be more chroma um, in the lightmost facing planes. And the uh, half tones, so somewhere around here, are going to be in pretty much the local flesh tone of the model. What we see for the most part is color being influenced by the light. See? that passage and the thing is to just keep moving uh, you don't don't be stuck in one place and then feel like you have to continue to push and push and push and push the important thing is to have a sense of values know what your values are 
you don't have to count them, uh, so to speak, but you know, just have a, an idea of what your local values are so that you don't have any major jumps in value. And in this stage, make sure to be focused. Listen to some good music, whatever music you like to listen to, and make sure your phone is on silent. Don't let anyone distract you because this takes patience. This right here, this is the part that um, if you make a huge mistake in acrylic, it's not as friendly mm. as oil paint. Because with oil paint, if I were working over a dry layer, I could just wipe off whatever mistake I made. You can't do that with acrylic. So you have to be much more committed even in these stages. And, um, you know, going back to the uh, Salvador acrylic paints, it's really nice to have that transparent white, the titanium white. At first, it kind of caught me off guard, uh, just because I was used to the more opaque ones with uh, Liquitex and Gamblin. But um, for flesh tones, for skin tone painting, the transparent white really, really helps because you can put in, you know, the light of the eye, for instance, the white of the eye is not white. It's usually some type of half tone. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of helps to, uh, you know, have that be hard, <laughs> harder to achieve. Here is a piece of paper towel. Just for example, you can see how much brighter the paper towel is. Mm. And the white of the eye that's just tricking you because all of the valleys around are darker relative to it which makes it look really light but it's not this light if you put in the straight white in the white of the eye even though it looks like that in the photo reference it's going to look like we have headlights instead of the actual sclera of the uh, model's eye and now let's just put in a few little highlights I'm putting in the shape of the distant window. There's a window in the background. Or, sorry, the light's coming from a, a window and a, um, a electric, an electric light. And then we'll sneak in a, a dark but warm value for the, uh, the iris. And then, you know, I think I'm going to move around um, into the background. I don't want to do too much for the clothing. Luckily, um, well, actually, you can't really see it, but luckily, the uh, the light and dark stage, I actually didn't achieve a completely, um, you know, bright white like I did when I did the underpainting with the Liquitex last week. Last week, so uh, it gives me some more uh, some more leeway with my values. The government did one thing right this year. They allowed seniors to get free dental care for years to come. Seniors 64 and older can get free dental work, crowns, implants, and x-rays starting September 2021. This saved me over 3,000. So now we can go ahead and have some fun with the, the background. I can already tell that I'm going to need more paint, so I'm going to put more of the oxide black a little bit more of the titanium white. So now we're going to transition from the, um, we're transitioning from the refinement stage to the uh, finishing stage. Finish doesn't mean, uh, I don't define finish to mean render every little thing. It just means you're getting close to uh, calling the painting complete. Now we have that little element in the background. And the nice thing again about acrylic is you don't have to really, you don't have to commit to it. Uh, because it, once it's dry, just go over it if you don't like it. Now I see that I have the arm placement a little off. I must have done that um, either as a mistake or on purpose. Uh, but like I said, it's acrylic. You can easily move it around. Okay, that's much better. So let's go ahead and just put the arm in there. How we see it. That looks like the arm is going up towards his eye. 
There's the elbow. Think of the distance from the joints. And I know it's too yellow, it's fine, I can adjust it. See how you can draw with mass? Instead of having to worry about all those little outlines, go in with mass. It's easier to see mistakes with mass, even though I didn't see the mistake before. And like I said, I don't, I don't care if it looks too yellow right now. It'll be dry really quick, and then I'll be able to go in and adjust it even more. It looks like the shirt even can move. And it's okay. It's a very relaxed way of working. All right, so now I think I'm just going to put in the stuff in the background. Let's do a little cut. And there it is. Remember, the finish doesn't necessarily mean to render every little thing. Um, the background, of course, was a little bit more subtle. Uh, the, the clothing, even more subtle, I think, than the background, to be honest. Um, I did put in a touch of the ultramarine blue, which I found to be really uh, nice and chromatic blue. But remember, uh, to maintain color harmony, it, it is a little bit better to keep the colors, uh, at least a, for portrait, a little bit less um, chromatic. Um, that being said, the Salvador Premium Acrylic Paints handled extremely well, and I'm extremely uh, satisfied with the, uh, the drying times. They dry pretty quick, and they're easy to move around. And I'm also really satisfied with the uh, color range that I was able to achieve. Let me show you some uh, close-ups. And I'd say the only the only downside really was the size of the, the tubes. The titanium white I completely uh, used up nearly completely. But luckily they give you two. So I have a larger one to, to use up for later. So there you have a close-up shot of the face. And I really do enjoy the, the range of flesh tones that I was able to get. And again, this is primarily with the Zorn palette. So the vermilion, the yellow ochre, and what would normally be ivory black, but um, is a oxide black, which handles pretty much the same. And for doing reviews, again, I, I really think that I, I want the paint, the painting to speak for itself. So um, yeah, I'd say really, really high quality colors. And you can see it really used up a lot of paint. Um, and that, that was important in achieving uh, the certain value gradations that I needed to get. And there it is. So Salvador Premium Acrylic Paints worked wonderfully. Salvador, thank you so much for giving me uh, this opportunity to create this review. I really do enjoy these acrylic paints. And if um, you were to ask me, or if anyone were to ask me, I would recommend this uh, to an artist friend. I would, I would recommend these colors. The only, the only thing is the titanium white is a little bit thin, uh, which makes it very useful for portraiture. Uh, I'm not sure if it's as um, user-friendly for still life or landscape, but that's not really a problem. Just use more paint, paint really, really thick. Uh, work in layers and they dry really fast. So really no complaints there and just buy more paint. Just have a thicker tube of paint with you and you're good to go. When I compare the colors um, to other artists' uh, great acrylics, so if I compare it to Liquitex, um, from my experience, if I compare it to Liquitex or to Golden, I don't see the, the color being any, any worse. I don't see the color being that much of a jump, uh, but I do enjoy the, uh, the harmonious uh, colors that I can get. And there, there's something in the transparency of the paints. It's not as, as watery as a student grade acrylic. Um, so if you compare it to Liquitex Basics, it's their, um, their cheaper version. That is just, it's pretty bad. In, in my opinion, this, it's thin, it's not as thick or opaque as the, um, the uh, Liquitex or the um, Golden, but it has a really nice um, 
the luminosity to the colors. The colors mix really well, especially with flesh tones. Again, I, I really tested this really hard with the flesh tones and I found that I got a really, really wonderful um, variety of flesh tone mixtures. That being said, I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. Again, thank you so much, Salvador, for giving me this opportunity to create this review for you. And if you would like to take online classes with me, those of you that are watching, go ahead to patreon.com slash upariartist, look for the mentorship tier, and I'll be uploading, and I am uploading lessons every Monday. I'm also now uploading uh, behind the scenes episodes. So if you want to see behind the scenes of what's been going on in the studio here throughout the week, go ahead and check out the, um, the supporters here that starts at $2. So at $2, you get to see behind the scenes. The online classes are $10 a month and there are many other benefits on my Patreon. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on the next episode. Been using these for months now. I wasn't sure what to expect, but once I tried these, I never... There we go. <clears throat> any any uh, thoughts about what you saw? Any questions? Uh, uh, I have a comment or two. Um, mm -hmm. It was driving me crazy that he never put the highlight on the other eye until the very end. Mm. Okay. And then um, it was okay that he left the flesh tones, for example, between the eyes looking yellow to me, mm -hmm. but it blended beautifully and I understood it after it was finished. Mm -hmm. And uh, he makes something that's very difficult look easy, but I so appreciate the step approach and there, there are many steps. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he's a fine artist, uh, excellent uh, portraiture, portraiture painter. Mm -hmm. Well, he has a, a wide range of uh, demos uh, that you can go on YouTube and see. I mean, literally, I think hundreds. Uh, you know, generally what he paints are like young women. And mm -hmm. um, he generally paints in oils you know, on a lot of those demos. So this is a little bit unusual for him using, you know, doing a demonstration on acrylic, um, you know, and I have well, Obviously seen... they, tr they trusted him enough to do it. And I did have a question about his little tray that he mm -hmm. put the paints on. It was a tray with mm -hmm. a sponge underneath and a piece mm -hmm. of paper over that. I didn't understand that part. Do you? Yeah. Think yeah. Well, you can buy those at just about any of the art supply stores. If you're working with acrylic, uh, what it does is it helps you keep the acrylic soft and from skinning over and drying completely. Um, to be honest with you, um, I think it's kind of a waste of time <laughs> myself. Um, okay. You know, for me, now I, I generally use acrylic either out of a jar or a pump you know, like gallon type thing. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll take a, uh, like a set or a, a probably about six or eight Viva towels and I'll fold them down to a mm -hmm. thick pad and wet them. You know, not where they're soaking wet, but you know, where they're, you know, pretty damp. And then yeah. I'll place the paint directly on top of that. Yeah. And then um, I work on a metal, uh, kind of like butcher's tray mm -hmm. and I'll just mix my paint on that and uh, and and I like that kind of surface because at the end of the day you know I'll pour water into the tray and the acrylic will release from that enameled surface and mm -hmm. I'll just wipe it out and, you know throw a big towel away uh, so it's easy to clean up you know but it you know I've kept acrylic paint you know, because I'll take that and I'll put it inside like a, uh, like a Tupperware cake uh, mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been able to keep acrylic paint literally usable for like four or five days. That's you know? great. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not under a lot of pressure 
you know, to like use the paint up or put just little bits of paint out at, at a time, I can still put a fair amount of paint out and use what I need and then save it, you know, for the next day, you know, um, within that, you know, container, as long as that pad is moist, you know, that paint's gonna stay, you know, pretty viable and, and workable. Very good. Another question was, did he use a different brush for each change of paint? No, I, you know, he, uh, from what I saw, okay, he was using the same brush. Um, now, well, let's, okay, let's back up a little bit. He used a, a, a large flat brush for the basic blocking, okay? And so what he did at first was divided the shadow side from the light side, right? Titanium white. And then he had basically the, the kind of neutral background, which became the shadow. And right. then the core shadow became, you know, that uh, it wasn't ivory black, it was something else. Uh, mm -hmm. But the black that he used, you know, became the core shadow. Right. And so, you know, he really didn't have to, you know, clean his brush out, you know, very much uh, at that stage. You know, he was just kind of working, you know, and, and kind of wiping the brush out. Um, and portrait painters do that. A lot of times they don't clean their brush totally because they want a little of that paint left in there so that when they do the next mixture, it, there's a harmony between the two yeah. and it, it's not this abrupt chain you make you know more subtle steps in there now when he started he called it oxide black oxide black okay yeah, that's yeah. yeah um which is kind of funny in acrylic because they're you know well they're all the same um when he started working in the more detailed areas right and remember, he was working with a really limited palette, you know. He had basically five colors out there. You know, he had a raw umber, a black, a vermilion, uh, Naples yellow, and white. And so when he started making those steps, you know, of, of different values and, you know, slight color shifts, you know, he was really only working in those three colors. So he really didn't have to go back and clean his brush out, you know, as he mixed the next value, because he was just adding a little white or yellow ochre to it to make it lighter. He generally started off with the darker color and went, you know, toward the light as he mixed. So, uh, you know, so you, so you don't spend a lot of time cleaning the brush, you know, in, in that process. Um, anybody else? Anybody got any questions about what we saw? Hi, Richard. Good to see you. Good to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> Armando, it's good to see you too, even though we haven't heard from you today. No. Um, you. I have a car problem. You have a car problem? Yes. I'm sorry. But that's fixed now. Good. Oh, good. okay. $75, so I'm taking donations. But anyway, I, you know, I just learning to deal with acrylic. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that when acrylic dry, get dark. But I noticed something, even you tell us to get that uh, paper towel and wear it and put the colors. Mm -hmm. after, after a while, that, the, the, the uh, top, top part of the color get hard. And at the end of the day, you have to just throw away, you know, it's like a... No, no, because it will, you know, like the top part of it will skin over. Yes. But the, but see, if you, now if you just put just a little bit of paint out, then what's going to happen is it's going to skin over and dry all the way through because you just got a little paint. If you put mm -hmm. a big, you know, a big amount of paint out there, mm -hmm. you're going to get the skin on the outside, but on the inside, just like with oil paint, it's going to stay wet. Yeah. Yes. The, the thing that I like about acrylic is that the, it's easier to clean the brush than when you work with oil. That's the only thing that I like. Yeah. The well, basics. 
Yeah, it is, but the fact is uh, acrylic is much harder on a brush than oil paint, and it will destroy your brushes faster because oh. the fact is it's kind of an illusion that it's, that it's easier to clean because mm -hmm. a lot of that acrylic paint will get down in the ferrule of the brush yeah. where you can't see it, mm -hmm. and it will dry in there. And yeah. so, you know, when, when you first get your brush, it's got a nice shape to it, and it's kind of rectangular if you're using a flat. And then over time, you'll notice that the brush sort of spreads out, you know, yeah. and you get, like, fingers sticking out of it. Well, that's yeah. because the acrylic paint got down in the ferrule and dried, or the oil paint. Well, paint will do the same thing. Other, other thing that I'm observing is easier to mix color with oil than with acrylic. For me, I don't know. Well, it's only easier in the sense that, you know, with acrylic, you'll mix a color and it will look like the right color and value. <laughs> and then you put it down and okay. as it dries, it will shift and get dark. Mm -hmm. Now, he was talking in terms of, you know, if you just use the paint thicker, it'll stay closer um, to the to the color you mixed. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, my personal experience is, you know, that hasn't happened. <laughs> you know, it would be nice. Now, now I will say that as I've used acrylic over the years, it's gotten much better than it was when I first started using them. Um, when I first started using acrylics, and this is a long time ago, this is back in the uh, late 60s. Um, you know, like I said, you'd mix this color, it would look bright, it would be wonderful. You put it up there on the canvas, it looked great. And then a half an hour later, it just disappeared. It just mm -hmm. turned gray. No, um, oh, okay. Other question. Mm -hmm. I have some cement figures in my patio, like mm -hmm. a frog, and I've been looking on, on Google to try to paint. You know, in some part of the world, they have those beautiful frog, colorful, even they are poison. Mm -hmm. If I use acrylic, mm -hmm. do you think the raining will wash out that color? Not for a while. It, it'll oh. take, it will take a long time. But now, because it's outdoors, yeah. Okay, uh, they do make exterior paints, and artist color acrylics are not really designed to be exterior paint. Um, mm -hmm. Now that you again, you can get acrylic based paints that are for exterior use, mm -hmm. and they'll you know they'll hold up for a good long time. But uh, something like that, you said that, are they made out of cement? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, I would probably either use uh, probably like an oil-based enamel mm -hmm. would be the paint that I would use on that kind of surface for being outside because they're gonna, that's going to last the longest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And um, if, if you, uh, you can get oil-based enamels at like home. Yeah, anywhere, yes. Or you, or you can go to a paint store and yeah. get them, okay? They're, they're getting rare <laughs> these days. <clears throat> you know, most of those oil-based paints are, are getting a little bit harder to find because they're being replaced with acrylic-based paints now. You know, pretty much so. Um, there's, you know, a few a few professional contractors will still paint an oil-based paint for for wood trim stuff like that, but they're getting they're getting hard to find now. Most of them have shifted over to acrylics, right? Is that basically what they like hardware stores sold as the? Uh... Uh, Rust-Oleum paints that you could spray and have little, there were little containers as well. Was that an oil base? Um, Rust-Oleum, when it first came out, was, okay. Um, and, and you're talking about in a spray can. It's, yeah, and they also have little jars as well. Uh-huh. Or little tins. Right, yeah. 
Um, like I said, at first, you know, and when I'm saying at first, I'm saying maybe 20 years ago, okay. yeah. they, they were, uh, you know, they were oil-based or enamel-based paints. I think even Rust-Oleum has begun to migrate over to an acrylic base, uh, even at this, this point. So, uh, so you, might, you might have to read the back, you know, of the can and, and really kind of get a, a good understanding of what you're buying. There. Um, because like I said, most commercial paint now is kind of headed that direction. Um, even, even the enamel paints, um, you know, now they have what they call an acrylic enamel. Okay. And it's, it's again, you know, it's a water-based paint. It's not an oil-based. Okay. Uh, which makes it safer to use, probably easier to clean up. Um, <clears throat> as far as the longevity of it, you know, they're, they're saying that it will last as long as, you know, their previous paints, you know, the oil-based paints. You know, how true that is, we don't know yet. <laughs> so we'll see, um, you know, how that works out. Anybody else? I noticed that at first his proportions were, um, they, they looked different than the picture. Mm-hmm. And I would have liked to have seen how he fixed that. It was, if I divided the face in half, mm -hmm. it was straight across the cheeks, like right through there. Yeah. Well, I think what happened here, and I'm just speculating because I don't really know. Um, he took a picture of the model. Okay. As a reference. Um, you know, for, for the reference, but it, the camera was not set up at the same angle he was to the model. Okay. And so he was seeing it a little bit differently than what he was projecting up there. You know, because, yeah, it, the camera can't be where he's sitting, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You're gonna get the yeah. Same okay. Um, now, you know, I, I think he, you know, when I got the impression that he was painting that, though, not from life, but from, um, you know, from the reference. And, and I noticed that, too. It's, it's like he had a slightly different view that he was painting from what he had projected up there. So why that is, you know, I don't really know. I'm just kind of guessing. Um, and that happens... <clears throat> Pardon me, I'll try to talk. You know, that happens a lot. Um, like when I'm at Benson and I was doing demos and people were looking, you know, from wherever they were sitting and they were kind of like, well, that doesn't exactly look like what I see. Well, no, because you're sitting over here, I'm sitting over here. But when they would move over and kind of sit where I was, then they kind of got it, you know, because they had the same view. Um, so again, I'm just kind of speculating that that's kind of what was going on there, but who knows. Um, it, you know, now, Veronica, do you use, you're using oil, right? I use oil, that's my, my first medium. Mm -hmm. um, I have acrylics, but you know, until I can, you know, uh, look at how to keep them moist, which I'm learning now how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, now I'll experiment more with the acrylics. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That is a challenge. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're designed to dry fast and, yes. and, and my big thing with acrylics and I used them for many years as an illustrator. Um, you know, my problem was, or my, my thing I didn't really like about them was that they're difficult to blend. Yes. You know, you don't get the same smooth gradations and you can't go back in and work into them and soften edges the way that you can with oil paint because it stays wet longer. Uh, the way I got over that as an, as an illustrator 
was I stopped trying to blend them and uh, I went and bought myself an airbrush. And so I was able to create all these soft gradations with them, you know, and, uh, and it worked out fine, <laughs> you know, at that point. But, you know, that's a, that's a totally different process and tool, you know. And yeah. I, I don't, I well, don't what know. What was the difference? What was the difference? How did the airbrush make the difference, Charles? Well, the airbrush, uh, you're not, do you know what an airbrush is? It's, it's a spray paint, right? Right. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a spray gun. A spray it's gun, a, right. Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, it's a very tiny spray gun that you can hold in your hand. Mm -hmm. And it's, so... It's electrified, right? It's what? It's electrified. Well, yes. I mean, you, you hook it up to an air compressor. Right. And the air, air compressor blows the air through the gun and picks up the paint and then blows it onto the surface. So it's not like you're making a paint stroke, you know, where you're going to get an edge. It's always going to have kind of a soft edge unless you make a mask you know that will give you a hard edge oh my goodness another whole realm oh yeah yeah totally different yeah, yeah. I, do, I do that i do some airbrushing mm -hmm. yeah so and how, how big is the compressor that you use robert oh uh, small. it's about a it's about uh 18 inches long by about uh, eight inches wide. And, and about- and it, makes, uh, it makes a lot of noise, right? No. Yeah, they do. <laughs> well- Some of them are quiet, but the, mine, mine makes the noise. Yeah, yeah. Now you can buy, you can buy compressors like at Home Depot. Right. That are for, you know, like painting houses and stuff like that. And those that's, are very- That's what I'm familiar with, right. Right. But they do make, they do make compressors for airbrushes mm -hmm. that are very small, and totally silent. That is so cool. Yeah. Huh. Now, you know, an airbrush compressor, uh, they come in all, all price ranges, uh, but the ones that are probably the better made that will last you longer and, you know, will give you enough power or enough, uh, you know, pressure through the air hose uh, to do really good quality airbrushing, those probably are in the $200 range. So it can get a little bit pricey. And the guns themselves are not cheap. Amen uh, to that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, you if I, you know, I started off using kind of a, a student grade cache airbrush. And, you know, they're well made, you know, they work well. And then eventually, you know, after I got into it, after a number of years, I m migrated and bought better airbrushes uh, by a company by the name of uh, Iwata. And uh, those are great. <laughs> I mean, they're wonderful tools, uh, but you got to really take care of them. You know, you really do. Um, I agree. Yeah. And when you spend, you know, when you spend $200 on an airbrush, you take care of it. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. It's, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not something you're going to put down at the end of the day and not clean because you, you know, you, you know the, uh, the, the misery that you'll go through in trying to get it unclogged. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. Even, even if you, even if you think you've cleaned it, you probably haven't cleaned it. <laughs> well, yeah, you haven't cleaned it until you've taken it apart and you've gone over all those surfaces with isopropyl alcohol to get all the uh, acrylic residue off of it. So, so you get really good at putting the gun together and putting and taking it apart, you know, which is, you know, I mean, it's really not that hard, you know, it's, it's a couple of steps, but you know, it's, it's like one more thing you got to do. Yeah. Plus, plus there's a few, there's a few pieces that are very tiny. Oh yeah. Uh, you have, that you have to be very careful that you don't drop those little fuckers. <laughs> no, 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 you don't drop them and you don't bend your needle. You and know. you don't bend your needle, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's like, yeah. It sounds like a, a, a um, the kind of training that a dentist gets to put in a drill a tooth and put in. Mm -hmm. and yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. Well, no, it's 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 not so difficult. It's just getting used to doing it, you know. Right. And if if you begin to work with them after a while, you get really good at it, <laughs> you know, 
and and you can get beautiful effects with airbrushes but again you know it can be expensive and again it's a whole nother thing you gotta learn right out there uh but yeah you you'd be amazed at what you can do with those things they're they're, they're wonderful tools so and particularly with acrylics because it's like airbrushing and acrylic they were kind of made for each other because the paint does dry so quickly i mean as soon as it hits the surface you know it's pretty much so dry and uh you know and you really can't get soft transitions of color in acrylic really any other way you know, than that so anyway um so we're going to move on i'm going to show you a uh another video and uh this is a fairly short video but again it's uh you know I, I like this guy and what he's really going to talk to you about is kind of the process of creating a painting and this is something i try to emphasize to all of you all the time and whether you're you're painting or doing something decorative or anything else you know, just, you might want to take some notes on this <laughs> because, you know, he, co he does a good job of really covering. Okay. You through the making of this large scale commission that I'm doing. Let's go all the way down. Today I'm going to take you through the making of this large-scale commission that I'm doing for a collector. And we are going to dive deep into some of the details and intricacies of how I create a painting like this. The process of creating a professional work of art usually looks something like this for me. Decide what I want to paint. Figure out what my goal is with this artwork. Decide on which materials would work best to realize the project. Find out the best process to make sure that I create the very best work that I can in a reasonable amount of time. And lastly, execute and adapt as I go. The first two points in the decision making process were pretty simple for this project. I didn't need to figure out anything since this painting is for a collector who commissioned me to create an oversized version of one of my small portraits. And the function of the painting is pretty straightforward. It is to look absolutely stunning in the collector's home. I actually don't do many commissions anymore, but I used to. I used to do many, many, so many commissions. When I started making a living as an artist, you wouldn't believe the things I had to paint when money was short and I was just starting out. Anything from chainsaw zombie dwarfs to naked grandmas. And all of that for a few hundred bucks. I'll let you do the math on how many I had to do to even make a somewhat decent living, but spoiler alert, it was ziemlich beschissen as we like to say in Germany. Welcome. Hmm. Really, those days are over though, and I don't have to take on any commissions anymore, but if you ask me to paint something badass, uh, <clears throat> giant and creative paint, or something that gets me totally excited, that also doubles as great material for a video, like this giant-sized portrait here, I'm obviously all game. And so, here we are. Now, you know my painting process for these kinds of paintings. You've seen it here before, I've talked about it many, many times before, but what I usually don't talk about so much is my decision-making process as a professional artist, and how and why I make some of the choices and decisions that I do. Why I'm painting on canvas, for example. It's not just a random choice. At this scale, it's a no-brainer to go with a canvas panel instead of a wood panel or an aluminum panel. It's much easier to handle. You can easily move it around in the studio, you can easily restretch and start over when you mess things up, and maybe most importantly, a canvas panel has less glare than a wood panel. And the final painting, at this size especially, will look good from pretty much any angle once it's up on the wall. Other of my material choices follow similar rationales. I paint with oil paint because it creates the most vibrant and luminous artwork. I use a lot of large brushes to create interesting shapes that you can see even when you're a few feet away. And I use thick stretcher bars so that the large painting really stands out on the wall. 
As you can see, all professional choices to make sure that I create the best work of art possible. And the same is true when it comes to the process. For example, to get my composition onto the canvas, I use a projector. Did he say projector? Yeah, absolutely. I am a professional artist. I will use every tool that helps me create better art more efficiently. It's not lazy, it's not cheating, it's just part of the process. It doesn't magically make you a great artist, but even if it did, who the hell cares? It's just the professional <laughs> tool that artists use to make sure they can deliver the absolute very best work they can. Because that's what being professional means. So if you ever heard the word cheating or anyone tried to shame you into feeling guilty about what you do or how you do things, I am happy to tell you there are absolutely no rules in making art. Absolutely zero. And that is a hill I am happy and willing to die on. Which I won't because I'm a freaking giant indestructible tank of an artist and I'm happy to shield all of you from all the idiots out there. My pleasure. But here's another thing that you usually don't get to see, but it's an essential part of pretty much every painting I create. At some point during the process, I switch to digital tools to help me figure out which direction I want to take the painting. It's probably one of the simplest yet most underrated and underused tools or techniques for traditional artists out there, but it is a tool. For the past few weeks or actually months, I've been using Clip Studio Paint for this, who are also the sponsor of this video. Whenever I'm unsure where I want to take the painting next or whenever I think about making some changes to the painting, I take a photo of my artwork and try things out digitally. In this case, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with the background, so I made a few variations. Back in the day, I used to do this with transparent sheets of foil that I put on top of the painting. Super inconvenient, but luckily, today we have tools like Clip Studio Paint and drawing tablets that make this an absolute piece of cake. Clip Studio Paint is a very powerful drawing slash painting software, and I'm not even remotely using it to its full effects. There's hardly anything you can't do with it. But what I personally like is their traditional brushes. They behave surprisingly similar to real paint in the ways that the colors mix, and that allows me to make changes and adjustments to my painting digitally and get a pretty accurate impression on how it will look once I switch back to real brushes and paint. If you want to give it a try and check Clip Studio Paint out for yourself, which I can highly recommend. They have a three months free trial that you can check out and you can find all the links and details for that in the description down below. There are many different ways to approach a painting project and there's really no right or wrong way of doing this. There are smart and less smart ways, there are efficient and not so efficient ways, but what it ultimately comes down to is finding a way of doing things that works best for you. I personally prefer a process that favors efficiency without compromising quality, of course, but your mileage may vary. Now, before we get to the real juicy part and simultaneously controversial part in my painting process, two things. If you made it this far into the video, don't forget to leave a like and comment down below. Really goes a long way. And secondly, if you want to dive even deeper into the art of creating dazzling paintings, and support the channel at the same time, you should totally become a patron of this channel, where you can now also check out the extended process video for this painting. It's unnarrated, but it shows you the uncut process from the very first to the very last brushstroke. Okay, let's do it then. Okay, it's super early, I'm super tired, but I gotta finish this painting today. And uh, this next part might get a bit messy. I know some of you love this part, but I also know some of you really don't like this part. And I can already hear people in the comments whining, but I don't really care. If you're seeing this for the first time, it might look like I've lost my mind, but I'm a professional. I know exactly what I'm doing. Don't send help. Let's do this. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm going to stop it real quick and minimize. Okay. You see the table over here in the corner? Yeah. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, brushes, paint. It's, it looks a little messy, doesn't it? Right. Nope. Yeah. A little, little bit like, uh, you know, chaos. <laughs> you know, it's raining over there at the moment. Um, but, you know, this is a studio. I mean, you know. He doesn't really, use easel. Pardon? He doesn't use easel. You just hang it there, leaning on the wall on top of something. Well, he does actually have, you know, um, he uses the wall as an easel. Mm -hmm. you know, he has a rack that he can hang the canvas on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looks like he's got two blocks or something under it to elevate it yeah. a little higher from where he had even mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's not an uncommon thing to do when people work on large scale canvases, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because your wall generally is a lot more stable than any easel you can buy out there, so. Right. So Charles, is this on an aluminum frame? I, I, I no. know we made a point about that. Well, no, he was, he was saying that he's working on a canvas, a stretched canvas. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, because of the advantages of working large and the fact that he can move the painting around, um, because it's lighter than if you worked on an aluminum panel or a wood panel or any of the other variety of surfaces that you can get out there to paint on today. So he was just comparing the weight of the different types of canvases. Right. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Yeah, the different types of surfaces. And, right. you know, some people, um, and I would be one of them, that uh, when it comes to doing large-scale paintings, uh, I actually kind of prefer working on a wood surface rather than a canvas. Um, canvases are easier to transport and move around. But just the tactile feel of putting paint, you know, on a, uh, you know, on a panel to me is better. You know, I have more control of the brush because it doesn't give the way, if you get a very large canvas, uh, mm -hmm. I don't care how tight they stretch it. When you begin to get into the middle of the canvas, it gets kind of springy, right? It gives a lot. Uh, you don't get that with like medium and small size canvases, but when you get to like a 60 inch or 80 inch canvas out toward the center, it's, it's almost like painting on a trampoline because the, the canvas gives so much. Um, don't some of them have a, like a, almost a, a cross section uh, reinforcement? Yeah, they do. Middle and halfway on either side, either direction? Yeah, they do, but even with that, and again, it doesn't really matter how tightly they stretch it, uh, because of the fact that it's stretched over such a large area, it tends to be really kind of soft in the middle. And, and one of the things you get, <laughs> you know, particularly if you paint rather aggressively, you know, on a paint surface, is that out toward the middle, you actually get where you can see where the crossbar was in the painting because more paint builds up there, you know, oh, because, wow. <laughs> because it does push up against it. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, if you're going to paint on a canvas, or at least when I paint on a large canvas, like the one that I did for Claudia, for example. Okay. Um, that was a really large canvas. It was like, uh, what was it? It was a 40 by, a 40 by 72, okay? And, you know, it's, uh, you know, you really had to be it's very terrible. delicate with that surface when you were working kind of in the middle of it. And, and you right really- I don't have any time. I don't, know. I don't have anybody giving me no questions. No question. Oh, I guess Armando's talking to somebody on the phone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At any rate, um, you know, when I was working on the middle of that, you know, really had to be, you know, really gentle with it because 
it, it's, it's really, really easy to, you know, put a lot of pressure, you know, down on that paint surface. So, uh, you know, you got to kind of get used to, you know, um, you know, the way you work and you got to pick your surfaces and things, you know, you know, really based on what works best for you. And, uh, you know, I, I like a rigid surface, you know, um, because I've gotten used to handling a brush in a certain way where I use a kind of a light touch with it. You know, I can get a lot of effects on a hard surface that I just can't get on a canvas, and particularly a canvas that's really like springy. Um, you yeah, know, so. It's, Is he working in acrylics or oils here? Well, now he's working in oil. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I thought so. Yeah, but the thing, the thing I wanted to kind of introduce here is the process. And uh, he's got a couple, he had one, and I thought this was it. Evidently it wasn't, because it didn't get to the points that I, I wanted it to share. Because it took, um, on one of his videos, it took you through the steps where he did the thumbnails and the preliminary work. And, and showed you all the upfront, you know, before I ever started making a mark on the canvas. And this, I thought this was it. It was, it was in the queue of the history things that I had watched, and I thought this was the one. Evidently not. <laughs> but again. Regardless, hmm? regardless he's, a, he's a guy after my own heart. I like, yeah. I like his attitude. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, he's, he's got a lot of videos on YouTube. And um, he's got a lot of good stuff to say about working as a professional artist. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's built a career, you know, out of doing this particular type of art. And he's kind of gotten, you know, where he used to paint, they were very contemporary, uh, you know, figurative paintings. Now, now he's kind of gotten into this modern thing of, you know, they call it deconstructive uh, painting where he goes back over it, you know, and kind of destroys some of the edges and things like that. You know, I'm personally, you know, not a big fan of that, but hey, you know, whatever, whatever works for you. So, um, but it's, you know, it's a choice like everything in art. So. Anybody got any other comments about that? Anything they want to say before we move on? You guys are so quiet today. Did you did you not have enough coffee this morning? We're overcome by the art. Okay. My issue is not enough coffee. <laughs> not enough coffee? Yeah. Not enough coffee. Okay. Well we got we got one more video to get through. I better get a second cup. <laughs> yeah, and um, and it it will work out time wise really well. This is a fairly short video, okay. But I wanted to, I wanted to throw this one in the mix, okay. Since we're talking, you know, mainly about acrylic paint, which is water based, um, and the versatility of it. Here's another thing you can do with acrylic paint that most people don't really think about, but it's great for this stuff, and. Uh, and this lady will explain it to you, I think, pretty well. So we're going to jump right in here. And oh, good. Paint on marble. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting process. Let's see. Yeah. Get her all the way back at the beginning. All right. And away we go. Maybe <laughs> as it thinks about it. My name is Heidi Finley, and I am doing something called paper marbling today. Paper marbling is a, a very old and traditional craft that comes from many different parts of the world. I think it's interesting because all those different parts of the world use slightly different materials and have, of course, different different words for what they do. Um, what, what essentially I do 
is to decorate paper. Um, I make a painted pattern on the surface of this thickened water here. And then if I want, I use tools like this or this comb here. This is called a rake. And I move the colors around and organize them into specific patterns like this. And then after I'm happy with the painting on the surface of the water, then I lower a sheet of paper down onto the surface of the water and pull it up and I have a one of a kind original contact print. Okay, so I'll show you what, I'm, what I like to do. I have laid down my first color and that is black. I'm gonna put just a little bit more on here and hopefully not get any on the camera. It's not much to look at just yet, but as we put more color on, you'll be able to see better. I have different, different colored paints here. These are acrylic paints. And again, there are as many different ways to marble as there are marblers. So some artists will use watercolor, some use oil, some use ink. Now, this is the essence of marbling. What's happening is as the color touches the surface, it doesn't blend with, with the color that's already on the surface. It pushes, it pushes it aside. And that is how in the end, we have all, all of these beautiful little bits of pure, brilliant color. Nothing ever blends, it never gets muddy. Okay, maybe some yellow. Now it's starting to be something to look at. Now we can see it. doing it now. Um, 
kids get in there with a the stick and they go in circles round and round and that's fine. Then you end up with an abstract looking pattern and that's fine too. We're getting there. Does anybody have any questions? This particular pattern right here is called a Gelgit. And from this Gelgit, we can make lots of beautiful, traditional, very intricate patterns. Again, if I wanted to, I could lay my paper down right now and print it, it would be beautiful. But I'm going to use more tools. Okay, I'm going to use my comb. Oh, wow. Like magic. One of the things I love about paper marbling is when you look at the end product, if you haven't seen the process, it, it just looks magical, I think. Mm -hmm. And then once you see the process, the magic is gone, but, uh, but you've been educated. <laughs> All right. Okay, this is looking really nice. This pattern that we have now is called the a known peri. I think that's a French word, known peri. And from here, we can make all kinds of, of different patterns. I think I will keep it simple. I'm going to use my double rake. And I'm going to make what's called a peacock pattern. I like what he's doing. All right. Oh, yeah, that's a nice one. That one came out very nice. Okay, we got all our, well, we got a myriad of colors in there, and they all stayed very, very much separate. There's lots of contrast in there. All right, I'll get the paper. I bet now. This probably takes a little, a little practice, finesse. a little practice, okay. and not too much caffeine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Okay. Can I get you to hold that right there for us? Thank you. And drum roll, please. Here we go. That's just awesome. All right. You think like a computer did that. I know it. I know. Again, to see the end product without knowing how it's done, I I think I just shook my head the first time I saw it. Thanks. Good job. All right, now we rinse it, hang it up to dry. I saw this done at an outside fair, um, and I was immediately drawn to it. I made one myself, just like I now offer people the opportunity to make one themselves. And I could not walk away from the booth. I, I was I was hooked. And so I went home and sat down at my computer and did internet research. Um, I learned all I could and then I ordered a kit. Um, and by trial and error taught myself 
how, how to marble. And then I also took a workshop. Um, and, and I keep learning. Every time I do it, I, I learn more. Where does it originate from? It has originated um, from many different parts of the world. It's, it's unknown how much each part of the world knew about the other um, because it, all, there are different materials used um, according to what was available in each part of the world. Marble good. Okay. What'd you guys think of that? That was great. Wow. That's an easy made abstract. Right. So I have some questions, Charles. Okay. What kind of paper was she using and how did she keep the paint from dripping down when she pulled it out of the liquid. Okay, so there's a few things I need to explain to you about this, okay? <clears throat> like I said, she was using an acrylic paint. Okay. All right. Now the paper you wanna use is you wanna try to use as good a quality paper as possible, which means that you want to use something with a, what they call a high rag, content right okay not a wood pulp paper so you're gonna buy um like good quality but lightweight sheets of either drawing paper that are 100 percent rag mm -hmm. or even like a lightweight watercolor paper that's mm -hmm. got a smooth surface on it um like for example some of the stuff that we use at the Benson Center, the Reeves BFK, would mm -hmm. actually be a very good paper to use for marbling. It'd be great. You know, now it's a little bit thicker than a lot of this, but, uh, but it would be fine and it would work really well. Uh, and you can use both colored papers as well as white paper. It doesn't really matter. Um, now, what did she use to make the patterns with, Charles? Was that on wood or? Yeah, well, she had taken, um, you can buy marbling tools that are pre-made like that, that have, they've got, like they said, a rake, a comb, um, you know, but you can also get a lot of those tools at Home Depot, you know, in the paint department. Um, you know, like different combs and things like that that have different spacing in them. Some are very open, some are closed. Uh, so you can get your tools from a variety of, of places. You can also make your own mm -hmm. because all it is basically is a, uh, a board that's cut to the width of the tray and then you put nails, you know, and space them, you know, uh, kind of evenly um, in, in the rake uh, sort of category they had not one row of nails but two and they were sort of staggered so uh, in in a comb it's generally in a single line and they're again evenly spaced so so you, again you can make your own tools if if you want now the thing I want to share with you is that there are, as she said, there's a lot of different ways of going about this and you can use a lot of different materials. Um, you know, one of the places that she recommended was, you know, she recommended that you buy a kit. Well, the kit comes with basically what the, we call the sizing, which is what you put in the water. Mm. And it, it thickens the water. It's, it's not just straight water, okay? It's, okay. yeah. Now, you can watch other videos on marbling, and some people use simple materials like you could have around your house. Like, for example, some people use cornstarch in the water. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a perfectly fine thing to use. Um, and then you can buy, I want to say it's album uh, is the material. 
that they generally, if you're going to order it online, what they send you is, is what they call album. And it's a, it's a powder. You add it to the water and it does the same thing as a cornstarch. It just thickens the water and, and creates uh, a certain tension level in the water so that when you lay paint on it, the paint doesn't sink to the bottom or it doesn't just disperse everywhere. And that's, that's really the key, you know, is the type of paint you're using and when you get it on the surface, you know, you want it to flow. How much size are you put in the water? Uh, they'll, you know, it will give you instructions, you know, okay. depending on, you know, what? the type, type of material you're using. Now, if you're, if you're doing it at home, um, I watched a video where a woman was using cornstarch. And it wasn't really a lot. It's, it's like maybe a couple of tablespoons of, of cornstarch into, yeah, in, into, well, enough water to fill that tray that she was using, uh, which wasn't really a lot. You know? mm -hmm. um, and in this particular case, this woman was using one of those enamel butcher trays that I use as a palette for my acrylic. So... You know, it's probably about probably about 18 inches long by about 12 wide mm -hmm. as a size. But you know, I've I've seen people do marbling in you know cat litter pans. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, you know, any any kind of plastic container, metal container that will hold water uh, that's shallow. You know, uh, you know, some people do it in like uh, those cake things you can buy at Publix or, or Kroger, you know? Yeah. Uh, so you can use a lot of different materials, you know, for that. Now, she was showing you a process that's called Turkish marbling, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there are different types of marbling from all over the world, okay? Including Japan. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and again, you know, they have a totally different process. And where she's using acrylic paint, uh, they're using sort of a traditional ink, uh, colored inks that are dropped into, you know, the, the sized water. And as she also mentioned, you can use oil paint. And in Italy, uh, that, that's basically what they used is an oil-based paint uh into a water base and i i think in that case they don't add any sizing it's just water it because, oh, yeah because the oil good. will float on top of the water and so yeah. you can use your thinned oil paint and drop it in you know now the drying time and stuff i think is considerably different because it's oil you know so it's yeah. going to take longer to dry um <laughs> but again you know there's there's probably as many ways to marble paper as, mm -hmm. as there are ways to use paint. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different varieties. And, uh, and you so can- So was the lady that we saw teaching a class to a group of people? Yeah, she was at like a craft fair and she was kind of doing a, you know, like a, a, a demonstration. So right. she had pans set out so that, People can not only watch the process, but try it themselves. Yeah, that looks like such great, interesting things to do. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the one of the things that didn't get mentioned is when she was going over the the surface with a comb mm -hmm. or a rake. You don't stick <clears throat> you don't stick the rake all the way down into the water. You're just going just barely across the surface. You know, you don't want to get it buried too deep because if you do that you'll start sinking a lot of your paint okay yeah so you got to have a kind of a delicate touch and kind of mm -hmm. take your time with it you know um, have, you done, have you done marbling yourself i have <clears throat> i have it's uh it's it's a really fun process and um you know i you know i've never done it at home by myself i tried it at like a craft fair one time when I went there and it was really a lot of fun. I pulled a couple of different prints and it was, you know, it's really unique, really interesting. So what did you do? Hang them on a, um, a clothesline to help them dry off? 
No, um, you can take them and you can lay them out flat on a table. Now what will happen, because even with archival paper, that's 100% rag, as it dries, it, it'll begin to get a little bit wavy and mm -hmm. buckle. Mm -hmm. And you let it dry out pretty much so till it's almost totally dry. And then you put it in a press or you stack like a lot of weight on top of them. And you can, at that point, the color's not gonna transfer. So you mm -hmm. can stack them up on top of each other Mm -hmm. <clears throat> take some of your big art books and a, and a flat board and sit on top and leave them there for a few days and they'll come out perfectly flat. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, first, the first thing that came to my mind when watching her do that was wouldn't that be a beautiful background for an oil painting on top of that? Can that be done? Yes, it can actually. And, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to show you that because what you can do with any of those archival papers and acrylic paint is you can use the like the gel medium or an acrylic base and on top of a canvas or a wood panel you can put that down just just like you would like hey. leaf or any other kind of surface and then you can use oil paint on top of it or for that matter of fact acrylic paint could you use 300 pound paper so that it would not curl as much well, you don't really have to worry about the curling. And if you're going to now, okay, you could use a 300 pound paper. If, if you're going to, you know, not, you know, adhere it to a flat surface and you just wanted to paint on top of it, you know, I could right. see you using 300 pound, but you okay. could get away with a lot lighter paper and then mount it to your canvas or panel. See? Uh, the thing with the 300 pound paper, it's going to take longer to dry out, right? Right. Yeah. But, you know, you're going to flatten them all out anyway, so it doesn't, yeah, it could be very thin if, if you want to. Well, if you use it like on, a, uh, like on a, a stretched canvas, you know, a small stretched canvas, you could just put the canvas in there like the paper, right? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. What? It's not... It's not quite the same. Um, you know, one, the canvas has got a lot of weight and it's gonna sink into the, the water or down below the size surface. So you wanna do it, you know, you want that paper to be able to just float on top. Okay. It, it, yeah, you can't sink it into it. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's kind of like a collage piece where you can adhere it to a canvas you know, from the paper and then paint right on top of it. So here's the thing you want to keep in mind if you want to do that process. You want the paper to be archival, right? Because you're going to paint on top of it. You don't want the paper disintegrating and falling apart in 20 years. Um, and then you want to make sure it's thoroughly dry and that it's, it's laid down very smoothly and not you know, not a lot of wrinkles and bubbles and stuff in and on the surface. So, um, and if I, you know, I guess my advice is if you were going to try to do something like that and you're going to use like a large area, like a full sheet, you know, as a background, then I would probably put it on like a panel rather than on a canvas. And the reason I'd put it on a panel is that a panel's not going to shrink and they expand as much, you know, with the change in weather. It's heavier in weight though than a thin canvas on. Well, it thin. is. Yeah, it's it's a little bit heavier, but you know, the wood panels that they're making today are really pretty pretty lightweight. You know, they're pretty easy to manage. Okay. Um, you know, because they're only using like eighth of an inch thick uh, ply for the surface to paint on, and. Um, you know, so they're, they're pretty lightweight and they're stable. You know, they, they don't, they won't wrinkle and, you know, distort much over time. And it, again, and it won't sink into the paint. You said that was one of the things that had to float on top. It's able to float on top. No, 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 no. You're not able to use that, pan, that panel to put into the surface, but I'm saying okay. take your the paper, paper mount the okay. paper on it again because unlike canvas 
it's not going to move. Right, right. And so it makes the whole piece a lot more stable. Right. Yeah. You see, it's, it, it goes back to that argument of, you know, you have the Renaissance, and if you look at, like, probably 90% of the stuff that came from the, you know, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries that has lasted in museums, probably 90% of it is on a wood panel. Okay, very little of it is on canvas. And you see artists started painting on canvases, you know, back in, you know, the late 15th century through all the way through today. But canvas doesn't last the way that wood does. It just doesn't. You know, the Mona Lisa has lasted as long as she's lasted because she's on a wood panel. She's not on a canvas. Okay. And so, you know, it's, it's that question of what's more archival, right? Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So when, you, when you say that you're going to, you make a piece of marble paper and you attach it to a wooden panel, mm -hmm. what do you use to attach it? Glue? Well, you could use a glue, but I would recommend that you use this, you know, acrylic gel medium. Okay. Yeah, and that's, you know. Acrylic, what kind of medium? Gel medium, acrylic gel yeah, medium. Yeah. Can you find wood panels in the art store? Yes. Oh. Yes. I don't know. Yes. The gel medium, is that what you use also to make the uh, acrylics uh, dry less fast? Um, no. The gel no. medium, yeah, the gel medium is used to make the acrylic either more fluid and or thicker. You know, they have different, you know, they have like heavy gel medium, which is very thick. And then they have like, they call it matte medium or gloss medium. And again, that, that makes it thinner, but it also makes the paint either really shiny or really matte. <laughs> um, but you could use any of those as like a glue or an adhesive. Okay. Because right. at the end of the day, it's all just acrylic. It's just clear acrylic. And so you, you know, it's plastic. So when that dries, it's going to, you know, it's going to dry, it's going to be permanent. You know? So. What is expensive these days? What is expensive? What would? Oh, well, yeah. the, uh, actually there hasn't really been a lot of fluctuation in the price of those wood cradles. They haven't gone okay. up. Yeah. Okay. They're pretty much so what they were two years ago. They haven't really changed. They're called cradles, like a baby's cradle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh, you know it's a stretch wood panel, and and the back of it, you know the the frame and the crossbars, they're called a cradle. Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. How yes? deep is the water? How deep is the water, you know, in the marbling? You know, maybe half an inch to three quarters of an inch thick. Okay. It's not very deep, you know. And it's just, you know, it's just in a kind of a shallow tray. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So again, you know, it's, it's <coughs> you know, it, it's just another kind of fun thing that you can do with paint. But you can put it, you can take the paint from the tube and just dot it in there and then use your fork no. or whatever, go through it? No. No, no. You would have to thin the paint. You know, and then she put it on some kind of brush where she went, she tapped the brush. Right. To make it yeah, the paint's got to be fluid enough that it will come off of, of the stick or whatever that you're using. Um, I, thought that, I thought when you put the water substance in the tray, you could put the paint in at that time, and it would uh, loosen up, and you could, you know, just wave through it. No. Yeah, but yeah, if you if you if you take paint straight out of the tube, Gene. Yes. It's it's going to be thicker. You know, so okay. you'd add a little water to it and thin it okay. until it's it's kind of like a milky kind of <laughs> consistency, right? Okay. Yeah, probably not as thin as water, but 
you know, probably about as thick as milk, right? Yeah. And that way, when it hits that surface, it's going to be fluid enough to spread and be able to move around. Oh. Yeah. So, so thinner than you would probably generally paint with it. Okay. Uh, anybody else got any questions? <laughs> I, I, one, one thing, Charles. Huh? You, 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 you have created in me a way of spending one hell of a lot of money. Thank you very much. Sir. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey. You know. There you go. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm only here. Yeah, I'm only, I'm only here so that I can help support all the art supply stores. Thank you. All right, you're doing a great job. Well, Bob, think of it this way: we can't wait to see the background marbles and then the the object that you choose to paint on top of that. <laughs> it will be me, me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 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 a kind of a wonderful, kind of fun way of doing things. Um, right. You know, and again, you know, the paper being archival, you know, you don't have to worry about it deteriorating. And if you're using oil paint and or acrylic, you know, you can, you can go right over the paper, you know. Uh, so, no, no problem. Okay. Anyway, hopefully, you've gotten some wild and crazy ideas to go play with. <laughs> all right. All right. And, all right. So, Armando, I know you're waiting for lunch. Yeah. See so, you. Take care. All right. Um, tomorrow, by the way, uh, where were we do tomorrow? Were we going Polo to ground. Cascade tomorrow? The Polo Ground, yeah. Polo ground. Yeah. Okay. I talked to the guy at the Polo Grounds. We are going to have to not go there. Uh, I will send out an email. Yeah, they, yeah, because of the horses and things and the riders out there riding on that trail. They, yeah, they, you know, they don't, they don't want cars, painters, and horses that close together. I see. Okay, yeah. Okay. He, he said, yeah, if you would have come a couple of weeks ago before the horses and all. But, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, I'm going to send out an email. Um, and we're going to move the location okay. for tomorrow. Okay. So just a heads up, let you know. Okay. All right. Talk to you guys later. Okay. Thank Take you. care.